My organization's called United Sludge Free Alliance, and I'm the founder. Um, and the goal of our organization is to provide information about the health and safety risks of using um, sewage sludge and biosolids that is marketed as fertilizer. We've been going for about 10 years, and uh, I started this because um, a friend of mine, they were pouring this municipal waste near his home. Um, he said, there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, when I started looking into it, we realized that um, there was a lot of um, regulations limiting his ability to stop it. And I thought, if I'm gathering information for him, everybody else is doing it too. So we made the nonprofit be mostly um, information based online. But I also get calls and emails from not only around the country, but around the world. Um, I've been contacted by um, concerned citizens as far away as New Zealand um, and working, uh, providing information to people. PFAS uh, and your compost as a contamination vehicle. Um, PFAS is an acronym for polyfluoroalkylide substances. That is what is in flame retardants. So, um, uh, and, and we'll talk more about that later, but just in case any of you weren't familiar with that term. Um, and because sewage sludge is marketed as a compost and as recycling, that's why I wanted to have uh, reevaluating recycling our waste. So, um, did you know that every time you flush the toilet or clean your paintbrush, you're unwittingly contributing? Oh shit. So, where does sewage sludge come from? Everything that goes down the drain of every home, industry, business, hospital waste, mortuary waste, fracking waste, all goes to the wastewater treatment plant. Wastewater treatment plants were to clean the water to introduce it back to the community. They were never intended to make fertilizer. Um, and I'll just give you guys all of this as we zip along. Um, so what the sewage sludge and biosolids is, you flush the toilet, you flush the sink, everything goes to the wastewater treatment plant. They add chemicals, they heat it, they squeeze it. The liquids are released back into the community. The solid waste is what is sewage sludge and biosolids. Um, the EPA is what regulates what should be tested for in sewage sludge, um, and that's nine heavy metals and two indicator bacterias. That is it. Everything that went down the drain of industry, business, and hospital, and you only have to test for nine heavy metals. That's why I founded this organization. Um, over eight million tons of sewage waste is land applied. That's to farms, but also sold as bag fertilizer. It's also at parks, playgrounds, um, and um, golf courses. Anywhere where there's a landscape, they can legally spread it. Uh, wastewater treatment plants were uh, used more in the 19, uh, kind of opened in the 1970s more because of the Clean Water Act. This is really an infrastructure problem. We haven't changed the regulations in 30 years. Um, think of the chemicals we've added in 30 years. Think of the pharmaceuticals we've added in, in 30 years. Um, nine heavy metals, two indicator bacteria. That's it. So, um, so basically, um, and, and all of these I have cited, uh, University of Michigan, um, there's 14,746 wastewater treatment plants in the country. Um, and 56% um, to 60% of all sewage waste is land applied. Um, in California, um, we, there's um, 900 wastewater treatment plants, 4 billion gallons of wastewater daily, 250 biosolids composting, um, and 56% of all California's sewage sludge waste is land applied. So, this is a, um, just a short list of the things they find in the waste. Um, the EPA themselves um, says there's over 365, I will air quote, elements of concern. Nine heavy metals, two indicator bacteria. That's all you have to test for. Um, so the elements of concern um, include arsenic, cadmium, copper, lead, mercury, molybdenum, nickel, selenium, zinc. Indicator bacteria are E. coli and salmonella. So anything that is killed at a higher level than what the wastewater treatment plant, um, any bacteria or virus, 
is not killed off if you if you only heat it to a small amount. I have a v website that gives you more information than you'll ever want to know. Hmm. Get the hot peppers. What medications did I just take? No pharmaceuticals are tested. Um, they are finding antibiotic resistant coming from the wastewater treatment plant effluents because now you've mixed the bacteria and viruses from our human bodies with the antibiotics. Um, and so this is, this is a source of antibiotic resistance. Um, the effluents, the liquid coming out of the wastewater treatment plants gets deposited into waterways, generally rivers. Um, and uh, excellent industry resistant studies showing um, animal uptake of, of hormones and um, chemicals, um, including um, uh, fish and frogs that have both, uh, that have eggs in their testes, um, and including um, investigating uh, mollusks, which can't move upstream and downstream from wastewater treatment plants and finding the contaminants in there. So now we're going to talk quickly about PFAS. As I said, polyfluoroalkylide substances. Um, this was a chemical compound that was um, invented shortly after World War II by um, 3M. It was invented as a waterproofing. Um, 3M carried it for quite a while, um, and now we use it in waterproofing of clothes, stain resistance clothing, um, also in products like Teflon, um, and in um, flame, uh, flame retardant and um, firefighting foams. Um, the challenge with uh, PFAS is um, it, it, once 3M recognized how toxic it was, they stopped making it, but DuPont took over the, took over the chemical. Um, DuPont just lost a case, a, a huge case, uh, that proved that um, people were, were being um, contaminated. Um, as the slide says, um, multiple types of cancer from low doses um, from, the, from PFAS. Um, if, if you're interested in the PFAS issue, especially because California is, is swimming in it, um, there's a film out called The Devil We Know, and you can just download it for four bucks online um, and, and watch it in, your, in the comfort of your own home. Um, aside from the cancers, um, it affects pregnant women. Um, uh, that was one of the things that the DuPont study found was that the women were having babies that uh, had birth defects from being exposed if they were working at the um, PFAS count, um, location. Um, also endocrine disruptors. Endocrine um, controls your weight gain, your thyroid, brain function, reproductive cycle. Um, so um, you'll see uh, in organizations that are fighting PFAS um, or the EPA, they'll say it's an element of emerging concern. It's not an element of emerging concern. They're just paying attention to it now. It's nothing new. Um, both the industry and the government have been tracking this problem for a long time. Um, the, especially with um, DuPont's um, loss of their, of their um, legal case. Um, you know, and, and once again, um, nine heavy metals, two indicator bacteria. They may have been tracking PFAS for years, but they have not changed the regulations for 30 years in what can legally go into the stuff marketed as your compost from wastewater treatment plants. So what's the big deal? Contamination of your food and water no matter where you live. A lot of times when they're talking about PFAS, they'll say it's a military base issue. People who work at military bases or with firefighting foams are in contact with it. But it's your food and water no matter where you live because it's coming through the biosolids and sewage sludge waste. Um, obviously, the health and safety concerns for um, neighbors where it's being poured, those are often the people who are contacting me because they say, my children are sick, um, my kids have asthma, um, uh, obviously a social justice issue. Um, we've had sludge haulers say there'll never be enough of you voting to make this stop. Um, and uh, because it's spread on farm fields regularly, that's a very s small population. So they, they pretty much figure you'll move away or you'll die. That's the, the boil down. Financial implications to homeowners, uh, and, and the main thing is the long-term soil implications. So what are farms for? Hmm, food or toxic dump? So um, I have this on the side for folks to look at. I can send anything. 
Um, but basically the rundown is, um, and I have the articles that you all have, um, the big thing that we're finding right now, the big thing in the news in the farming community is PFAS found in milk supply of a, a specifically a farmer in Maine who accepted sludge for 20 years from the city of Kennebunkport. He has not spread for 15 years. His, he, the discovery was his milk was so contaminated with PFAS, he had to stop selling. One of the articles says they just did the blood test on him. The average American um, PFAS in your blood is 4.2. His was 111 from drinking his own milk and living on his own farm. Um, the, and that's Fred Stone. Fred Stone, I will be working with him to create a, um, a, a webinar that anyone will be able to, to hear, um, hopefully in November. Um, the other is Art Schaap, New Mexico dairy farmer. He was downstream from, from a, um, a military base and his animals became contaminated from the effluents, from the water. Um, they, they euthanized all 4,000 of his dairy cows. Um, a uh, uh, farm in Colorado, closing because the irrigation supply again contaminated with PFAS. It, it, it contaminated everything they were growing. Um, garlic, spinach, carrots, but also their animals. So they went out of business. Um, and here's a little song, I'll, I'll be mentioning this more than once. So PFAS was found in a Wisconsin wastewater treatment plant to the point where they stopped spreading it on nearby farms because the level was so high. Now, um, and I'll just mention Wisconsin and we'll kind of roar through this. The thing about bag fertilizer is it's, it's excellent marketing to, um, to get rid of this stuff. Um, one of the largest bag fertilizer companies is called Malorganite. Malorganite is excellent marketing because it's Milwaukee sewage sludge. Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Do they test for PFAS? No. Um, and then, and then um, also um, food companies will do um, independent testing. So um, um, PFAS was found in um, Massachusetts cranberries and so Ocean Spray refused the product. So, um, but that's because that, that company decided to, to do that. Um, so this is um, Fred Stone. He's the farmer from Maine, the dairy farmer. Um, the, the, um, uh, farm was in the family a hundred years. Um, so with Fred, um, he stopped using the sewage sludge 15 years ago, but the level of contamination is still so high that, um, that he, he cannot sell his product. Um, he has put thousands of dollars in trying to re remediate, um, updating his equipment, um, even changing out his cows. Um, and uh, he, he keeps excellent, uh, excellent records. So he's in a lawsuit right now. Um, so part of my challenge in organizing a webinar is, is his attorney's going to sit with him on the phone. So, um, so that will be interesting. Um, so two of the articles you're, you're getting are, are specifically about Fred Stone. So I won't, I won't linger on this. Again, um, they're not em em uh, emerging contaminants. This has been a problem for a long time. This is another farmer who I worked with from um, 2006. Um, this is Boyce Land Dairy. Um, they were prize-winning dairy farmers also. Fourth generation dairy farmers in Georgia. They were told the sludge is safe. They were guaranteed it was safe. That was when they were winning blue ribbons. This is when his, when his land became so contaminated after 20 years that it affected his animals. So he's the one who called on it. Um, he and Andy McElmurray had levels of PCB in their milk two to 2,500 times higher than legally allowed on a human body. They had thallium levels 120 times higher. Thallium's rat poison. All of this came through in the sewage sludge. Now, Bill Boyce and Andy McElmurray both won their court cases in Georgia, McElmurray versus USDA, Boyce versus City of Augusta, but they lost their farms. And unfortunately, Bill Boyce, when he sold his farm, a developer bought it and put low-income housing. So this is why we need to start making noise about, I don't want this in my food, I don't want it in my land, I don't want it in my water. Um, I'll do a real quick one about water contamination. We know water doesn't stay in a political boundary. 
This is Hillsborough. Um, this is in North Carolina. The blue is their water area. The spots all around it um, is is where sludge is spread. This was a group that I, I was working with in North Carolina. Same with this is the Chesapeake Bay watershed. This is five states. So the different colors just just determine. Um, like the blue is Pennsylvania, where I'm from. Um, the green is Maryland. Red is Delaware. But this is all the Chesapeake Bay watershed. You're not going to clean up the Chesapeake Bay watershed if you're not paying attention to where the sludge is spread. Um, the two of the most um, permitted sludge sites in, in Pennsylvania are on that map. Berks, Kank, Lancaster, and York. Lancaster and York are our highest Mennonite and Amish communities. So these are people who do not have lots of access um, to computers. Um, and the thing to, to recognize too, the Chesapeake Bay watershed uh, is the water supply for 18 million people. So when we're contaminating the watershed, we are contaminating not just your neighbors. Um, so uh, this is um, PFAS contamination in public drinking water in America. Um, and, and you can see um, California um, has quite a few dots in there. Um, I'll just point out that this is a slide from the, environmental, um, the Water Environmental Federation, and I'll tell you a little more about that organization soon. You can look up the, um, any of this information that I'm citing that's theirs um, right, on, right on there uh, from their information. Um, so um, the, the other thing, again, about PFAS, um, that's a, the firefighting foam. But um, here in California, just as in my state in Pennsylvania, uh, it's legal for fracking flow back water to go to your wastewater treatment plant. So next time you wanted a glass of fracking water, just turn and tap. Ten heavy metals, two indicator bacteria. That's it. Um, it does have an impact on your home value. And again, people who I work with where it's being spread next to their home. Um, in Pennsylvania, you have to um, disclose if your neighbor's using sludge. Um, so uh, as of yet, they still say, well, you can't prove that that impacts my home value. Hmm. Well, this is, um, um, whenever, whenever you say, um, is, there, is there a change in home value because they're spreading sludge next to you? Well, there's no proof. So proof to me is kind of like um, body count. They're waiting for body counts. Um, this is from Cypress, Texas. This was sent to me by um, somebody who was fighting in Texas. Um, the wastewater treatment plant in 1985 on the left, the home development in 2010. All they did was cover that. Um, that had 18 oxidization plans for, pl sorry, ponds for air drying. Um, the neighbors then became so ill. Um, the, the woman who contacted me and was fighting it um, eventually became ill and then, um, then couldn't sell her home and went into foreclosure. So this is my friend Tanya. This is a woman from Lancaster, PA. Um, when they're spreading it, that's what happens to Tanya because she, that's what, when they say you have a, a health issue, you know, a preconditioned health issue, because she's had sinus, sinus surgery, the, their, the airborne is um, really the problem. So, um, so as I as I said, and again, I'm um, I'll probably be cutting this short, and I thank I thank my next speaker for giving me some leeway here. Um, this information is from the Water Environmental Federation. This is the the industry that handles your wastewater treatment plants and things like that. Um, Water Environmental Federation was uh, also called the Sewage um, Works Association, the Sewage Industry Waste Association, um, the Water Pollution Control Industry. Um, so this is their presentation on uh, PFAS management. Um, right here again, they're recognizing that PFAS contaminates the environment um, and it goes to landfills, wastewater treatment plants, and influence and biosolids, the effluents and biosolids. So the industry, that little WEF, Water Environmental Federation, that's the industry saying this. That's the industry saying, what's our pathways? Air, groundwater migration, ingesting drinking water. This is the industry's work. Um, again, how did we get here? Um, they're talking about that. I'm going to zip through these. If you want to check any of this, you just, you just Google it. 
Um, the thing that struck me was um, in blue they say um, uh, 12 parts per uh, trillion. Oh, we can't, we can't meet that. Hmm, 70, we can meet that. So, so that's the challenge is it's not about how does that impact your health. It's how does the industry meet the, meet the, the thing. Um, again, they're, they're talking about the contamination rates. Um, when I said bag fertilizer, the industry, again, they're listing what bag fertilizer they know uses biosolid sewage sludge. And then they're also listing the ones that don't. That's the levels of PFAS in the bag fertilizers that use sewage sludge. The really long one, that's malorganite, Milwaukee's sewage waste. Um, again, um, that the, just the graph showing malorganite specifically, that means they've been, they've been measuring PFAS since 2014. The poor water, when the effluence is used as an irrigation as it is here in California and in Arizona. The um, last E. coli outbreak we had, um, I think last Thanksgiving, um, the effluence was uh, irrigating from a canal not only where CAFOs put their, their wastewater, but where wastewater treatment plants do. Um, and, and then their take home message that, yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a strong correlation between uh, poor water, wastewater derived fertilizer, and some PFASs. The thing to remember um, is that every PFAS has a different chemical makeup. So you could test for PFOAs or, you know, the, all the variables, and each of those tests costs a lot of money. So, okay. I am down on it. Okay, sometimes we need to reevaluate science and our worldview. Uh, so FDA, EPA, where are you? Rules haven't changed for 30 years. One of the handouts is FDA recognizing that yes, in fact, it's in our food supply. Um, FDA um, Environmental Working Group did a wonderful article on this. FDA said, yeah, it's kind of in there, but um, you know, basically, our food safety risk says you'll be fine. Um, one of the things I handed to you last year, at a glance, EPA saying we actually don't know how to regulate this. Same thing, flip it over, EPA saying, um, yeah, actually, it's, you're screwed. Um, who says no? Some organizations like Sierra Club, um, also, of course, Organic Consumers Association, um, Environmental Working Group, bah, 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 how to fight this. Uh, I will have a little sign-up thing on my tablet here if anyone wants to get on my newsletter. It's called The Toilet Paper. <laughs> and darn, I can't even show you my movie. I'm going to make them let me do it out here. Um, uh, and join the United Sludge Free Alliance. We are a nonprofit group. You get a newsletter maybe a couple times a year. I type with two fingers. So it's like a Christmas card. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.